speak about the success, which is a 10-minute talk. I'm just kidding, but uh, that's what it says in the program. Have you changed your title too? Or is it also, is it Hilal's original title? <laughs> Lessons from past successes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Dreams about future successes. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank Halal and Jose, Sarah and Herbie for the privilege of being part of this symposium and being um, inspired by all of your insights. What I'd like to do today is to talk about um, what we've learned about human amyloid diseases in general from the transthyretin or, or TTR amyloidosis. So, TTR amyloidosis is the third most prominent neurodegenerative disease behind Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Many of you may be surprised to hear that. And that's because the wild type protein in about 5% of predominantly older males aggregates initially leading to cardiomyopathy and ultimately resulting in dementia, cerebrovascular um, bleeding and focal neurologic episodes. So I would submit that one of the reasons that the community has been successful in developing disease-modifying therapies for the transthyretin amyloidosis is because we've been really good as a group at stratifying patients, okay? So there are 140 disease-associated mutations, and then there's the wild-type protein that causes the predominant sporadic disease. These typically present with either a principal cardiomyopathy or a principal peripheral and autonomic neuropathy, but now we appreciate that almost all patients have all of these symptoms from the outset. It's just which one's predominant and which one's life-threatening Irrespective of the initial presentation, nearly everybody develops dementia, focal neurologic episodes, and cerebrovascular bleeding, providing, provided they don't die from the peripheral pathology, okay? So there are three forms of transthyretin that circulate. Let's see if I can pick up the laser pointer here. The two forms that have ligands associated with them do not aggregate, but the unliganded tetrameric form of transthyretin is the least stable, and it's the about 50% of what circulates, and that's the form that aggregates. So my lab spent quite a number of years figuring out the mechanism by which this protein aggregates. Let me start with the cell biology. Habits, sorry. So, by and large, all of the sequences of transthyretin that cause disease are secreted at wild type levels, with the exception of those mutants that initially present CNS dementia phenotype. Interestingly, those mutants are not secreted by the liver into the periphery. There's good quality control there. But in the choroid plexus, which secretes the protein into the brain, it's more permissive. So the mutant highly destabilized protein does get secreted in the brain. And that's why you see an initial CNS pathology. What I failed to mention in my out, uh, out remarks is that the concentration of transthyretin in the brain is about 200 nanomolar. The concentration in the periphery is about 5 micromolar. So greater than an order of magnitude difference in concentration. And that's why normally the CNS disease develops a little slower than the peripheral disease. So coming back to the mechanism, the key step here is that the tetramer is generally rate limiting for aggregation for the vast majority of the sequences. So once the tetramer dissociates slowly, the monomer misfolds, and it aggregates into a spectrum of structures that are non-native, including amyloid fibrils. 
And incidentally, we don't have ligands for most of these structures, which is a fundamental problem. We can't easily quantify all these. So our strategy was quite simple. What we decided to do was to stabilize the unliganded form of transthyretin by fashioning ligands that stabilize this weakest interface in the tetramer. This is the tetramer that, this is the interface where thyroid hormone binds, but it doesn't bind here in humans because there are two high affinity carriers. It's a, a remnant of evolution, if you will. So we decided we would stabilize this interface, and in so doing, we would prevent the entire process of protein aggregation from occurring. And we submitted that this would be a conservative approach because we wouldn't need to understand non-native structure proteotoxicity relationships to be successful clinically. That is, unlike many trials where they guess that the amyloid fibrils or oligomers are the problem, they develop an antibody to go after those. This is different. We're basically stopping all newly synthesized protein from aggregating. But therein was the risk, right? Because these patients have quite a high amyloid load, and it's unlikely that this strategy is going to clear amyloid fibrils uh, quickly. So that was the clinical risk, if you will. Now, we call these kinds of molecules native state kinetic stabilizers, simply because they bind to the native state of the protein much more avidly than the dissociation or denaturation transition state. So if you have a high affinity ligand, you can proportionately tune the activation barrier. Effectively, you lock the protein as a functional tetramer until it's turned over in the lysosome. So the original pushback we got from the FDA saying, you can't completely stabilize this protein. You're going to convert an amyloid disease into a lysosomal storage disease. And so the initial dose that we selected, as you'll see, doesn't give full stabilization. But like most things the FDA says, that's nonsense, OK? So it gets turned over just fine in the lysosome with complete stabilization. So how do we? demonstrate target engagement, because Ignacio couldn't be more right. I mean, you absolutely have to, if you're going to interpret the result, you got to be sure you're doing that. So what we do is take a labeled form of transthyretin, and we add it to patient plasma. Turns out that subunit exchange is also rate limited by tetramers. So we can see the subunit exchange between the unlabeled patient's tetramer in the reporter that we add. I'm not going to take you how, through how we do that, but it's really quite straightforward. So you can see this is a Nobel Prize winner who had cardiomyopathy as a primary symptom. And at the 20 milligram dose, we reduced the tetramer dissociation rate by about 70%. So this is the dose we originally did the trial with. And then this is the dose that's predominantly used today. So you know, almost complete, well, it is complete stabilization at, at the 60 milligram dose. This drug has a very uh, high binding affinity and a long half-life. So if the patient misses a dose, it's not so big of a deal. And um, you get um, pretty good um, uh, peak to trough changes, which are minimal. So here's the data as of um, a couple months ago. <clears throat> so this is a hard endpoint to argue with. This is death, right? So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. These patients have the VEL30 met mutation. That leads to a principal peripheral neuropathy and autonomic neuropathy. And after about 10 years, they develop stark CNS um, pathology. Dementia first, uh, followed by focal neurologic episodes, and then cerebrovascular bleeding. So, this is the untreated group and the defamatous group. And then what I didn't mention is historically, individuals with familial polyneuropathy were treated by liver transplantation because the liver has one copy of wild type, one copy of destabilizing mutant. So in principle, you can fix the disease by gene replacement therapy. 
And that works quite well. As David knows, the cardiomyopathy still um, proceeds in some of these individuals. The problem with this therapy, though, is that like many amyloid diseases, the vasculature becomes brittle. And so you take somebody who's 25 years old, you do a liver transplant, and they die in a small town. Nobody else wants the transplant now, even though it's life-saving. So that's the problem with liver transplantation and the reason it really doesn't happen anymore. Um, and it's really not necessary anymore. Early is critical. So these patients that were enrolled in the trial were taken care of, had a well understood family history by you know, clinical centers that specialized in peripheral and autonomic neuropathy. Look at the responder rate, that is the patients that respond to drug, if you just wait in the placebo arm for 18 months, right? You go from 70% of the patients responding now below 50%. And a lot of very good statisticians have looked at these two groups. They're as identical as you can get in a clinical trial. So this is a real effect that's been reproduced over and over again. Of course, what this suggests is that the way to really use these drugs is to get them on board super early. But we don't have really good early biomarkers yet. Cardiomyopathy is a much more life-threatening initial presentation. So five years from diagnosis to death is not atypical. And again, you can see that um, if you're in the placebo arm, significantly more people die than that 36-month uh, uh, head start that's exhibited in the tefamidus arm. And I can assure you that these curves will flatten out and trend towards uh, the top of this graph as the clinicians get better and better. It's already happening because another stabilizer drug company guessed that the progression was going to be this. And of course, these patients don't exist anymore. They're almost all on tefamidus. So their trial you know, failed because they assumed that the slope was going to be the same. So this is a, a very a tricky business, clinical trials. The problem with what we've done, to some extent, is that we still don't have a non-native structure proteotoxicity relationship for this disease, right? And I'll get back to that in a little bit. So th there are a lot of non-native structures that formed. David Eisenberg and Gordaire and others have characterized some of these structures, but there's many more that we haven't characterized that are equally plausible as proteotoxic species. And I think one of the really important things that the NSF could, sh could and should do is to fund the basic science that will make probes for these non-native structures so that when we have a successful drug, we can actually figure out why it's successful. So these results, of course, um, enabled Ionis and l -nylum using the ASO strategy in the case of Ionis and siRNA strategy in the case of l -nylum to knock down TTR levels by about 85 to 95%. This stops transthyretin from aggregating because it lowers the critical concentration below the concentration permitting aggregation. 30% of the patients don't respond to this therapy. The same is true for tefamidus. Okay. Now, we were, as, as I indicated already, but a much more careful study that one of my uh, special postdocs did not only, or graduate students rather, she was a board certified neurologist when she came to the lab. So she had this clinical study ongoing of more than 200 subjects. And she showed that two thirds of them responded to the 20 milligram dose of tefamidus really quite impressively. You don't want this neurologic impairment score to go up. But 30% interestingly had all the same pharmacodynamic response that the first two thirds or th so had. Yet, they progressed in pathology like they weren't even on drug. So of course, this along with the Ionis and l -nylum results suggests that there's something else driving the neurodegeneration in these patients. 
And it's absolutely critical to figure this out, right? Because if we can't differentiate this 30% from the responders, then figuring out biomarkers is hopeless statistically because you're always going to be plagued by this group that has disease that's not driven only or fully by proteinopathy. And there's reason to believe that this could be um, the activation of the immune system. We have some evidence for this, but this requires a much deeper dive than what we've done by just looking at the peripheral blood cells and the inflammatory markers therein. So when my lab started this in 1989, the hypothesis was that amyloid infiltration of postmitotic tissues caused their demise. And what we've learned from the clinical trials is that the amyloid load really doesn't change very much. It's, it's, it, it changes so slightly that it's hard to measure. Now, in, in spirit of complete information, the people who run these trials have not used the PET amyloid probes because this group of people were never convinced that that was worthy of measurement. I think that was a mistake, but it happened. So we don't have good data. What we do have is tons of MRI-like imaging data where we can quantify amyloid load in that way. And so by those metrics, it, it hasn't changed. What has changed dramatically is the amount of circulating non-native transthyretin. What I was shocked by, and now we've done this by um, native gels, we've done it by peptide probes, and we've done it by antibody-based ELISA assays. In every case, the amount of circulating non-native TTR in the patients is equal to the native TTR. So a lot of non-native TTR. This goes down by about 95% when you treat with tefamidus. When you treat with the SI or ASOs, it goes down almost completely. The aggregates are just gone in those individuals. But again, even though I think this is probably really important, because a different pathology is driving the non-responders, we can't show a correlation between that biomarker in the clinical response because this, we have this aberrant group there and until we figure them out, it's gonna be problematic. So as I mentioned, all of these patients after about 10 years provided you can fix their peripheral disease, develop dementia, focal neurologic episodes, which is transient loss of consciousness, which is really a huge problem in their life because they can't drive anymore can't perform any functions like that. And they have bleeds that are really severe. Things that we do that are obnoxious, like banging our head on the door, sends them to the hospital for a week. If, and they're lucky if they survive the bleed. As I mentioned, I think the main reason that the CNS pathology develops slowly is that the transthyretin concentration there is 200 nanomolar versus 5 micromolar in the blood. So the amyloid imaging agents work great for transthyretin, as it turns out. And so you can see this is from time of transplant. And so basically after about 10 to 12 years, you start to see substantial amyloid in the parenchyma of the brain. And like what is seen in cerebral amyloid angiopathy, the process of amyloidogenesis in the brain destroys the blood vessels from outside in. They become very fragile. There's a lot of microbleeds in these people, which undoubtedly contributes their, to their dementia. In patients where they have slowly progressing peripheral neuropathy, and that's the exception rather than the rule, Teresa Calejo showed that Things like the sum of box scores and other dementia protocols used for Alzheimer's disease um, shows quite a significant um, um, involvement after a few years of, of age of onset. So um, these more sensitive me methods pick up the dementia earlier than 10 years after 
liver transplantation in these more slowly progressing individuals in terms of their peripheral disease. Now, we didn't design this, but we're very lucky that Tafamidus gets in the brain at a pretty, it, it's not as great as, so this is the transthyretin tetramer concentration. This is the Tafamidus concentration. This is at the 20 milligram dose. Recall now that almost everybody is on the 60 milligram dose. And in terms of bioequivalency, that should give us four times the brain concentration of Tafamidus. Now the great news is, all indications from the clinicians is that these patients are not developing any of the CNS symptoms, even at the 20 milligram dose. So, and, and that's probably true because the CSF is much less complicated than the blood in terms of competitive binders. So I would submit to this group that the parallels here between transthyretin amyloidosis and Parkinson's is striking. What I haven't mentioned is that the earliest symptoms in this disease are gastrointestinal, quite severe alternating constipation and diarrhea, and sexual impotence for males. So the fact that it looks like we can at least delay at this point the onset of central nervous system pathology I think that's the way to go if we can. Let's treat the periphery with a compound that we know gets in the brain and hope that we can do prevention. That would be an incredible accomplishment, I think, if we can pull it off. And I understand that the Huntington's patients have quite significant peripheral symptoms too. And it, you know, it might be worth a partial success in going after those. So what are the key remaining questions? The answer is there are way more than I can put on this slide. We don't yet understand why the wild type protein that we all have aggregates in about 5% of older men, largely a few women. What drives degeneration in people who are resistant to the drugs? Is it over activation of the immune system or is it something else? We really need to figure that out. I think this is a good place to do it because we can sample the periphery quite uh, regularly without the patient complaining. This is also a really good, I think, platform to start to develop non-native structural probes because again, we can sample them and quantify them in blood. The problem is we don't have these probes for this case, I think the peptide probes are the way to go because you can synthesize a number of fluorescently labeled probes and you can do the analyses ex vivo in drug treated versus untreated and really start to figure out what's changing. What's the basis for the tissue tropism? That is, why is the heart destroyed in some people and other people have a principal peripheral and autonomic neuropathy and yet others present with CNS? pathology. And lastly, I would argue that given that there are successful disease-modifying therapies, we should become quite aggressive about using this disease to start to test mechanistically distinct drugs. For example, autophagy activators, right? I think this is the perfect place to test them and the like. So let me try to close there to roughly stay on time and say, um, a lot of people contributed to this over the years, way more than I can list on the slide. And I would just, I think the only thing I can say that's really meaningful today is that drug discovery is an ultra marathon. And, and I, I don't view people, it's, it's a mistake to say that a trial failed in many ways. Because if you design the trials well, you always learn from them. And if provided you have the resources and the safety margin to go ahead. By the way, I just want to say that even though this looks tremendously successful, right? The FDA, the FDA advisory board voted to approve the drug based on the initial trial and the FDA said no. And they still won't approve the drug for peripheral neuropathy, even though all the physicians use it because all the patients have cardiomyopathy. So the regulatory space here is just nuts. Um, enough said.
expand on the last paper. So why is the FDA saying it shouldn't be approved? So the, the FDA at the outset thought doing this trial in with one mutation, V30M, that is the predominant mutation for peripheral neuropathy, was a fantastic idea. I mean, they literally complimented. This is the best. This is absolutely the way to go. At the end, a different group of people came in and said, but this is this only the second most predominant mutation in the US. You guys have to do another trial in the US. And you know we're a small biotech company. Fortunately, we had an offer from Pfizer, and we decided to go with the offer instead of doing the second trial. But you know, they, there are a lot of people that died because of that FDA decision. Because as you know, anything like that delays the drug for another n years, which is the case. Hi, Jeff. That was great. Um, so many questions. One is, you mentioned the GI symptoms. Do the aggregates form there? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So aggregation in the, in the epithelial cells of the GI definitely are present. And it's unclear whether it's a dysautonomia, that is an autonomic nervous system dysfunction or something else, people are starting to look at that pretty carefully now. When you say epithelial cells, do you mean like enteroendocrine cells or all epithelial cells in the lumen? I think it's both. Okay. And the other question is, um, have they ever measured things like when the progression begins? How does that correlate with the immune profiling? Not so much the biofluids, but you know, uh, are, the, are there more circulating CD16 monocytes, T cells? Like, do we know anything about that? I, I think it's safe to say that very few people even recognize that the immune happening. system as possibly playing a role, and that's only been recently. We've got to change that. Yes, we are. But th those, those measurements have not been made. Okay. I mean, that's, I mean, there are drugs that tamp this down, and so it's critical to figure that out for those 30% of non-responders. Yeah. yeah, that's outstanding as always, Jeff. Um, so the, the question about the non-native confirmations and probes is, is really an intriguing and important one. So do you have, so, so just to clarify, when you say non-native, you're thinking about monomeric transthyretin, is that correct? Or are you thinking of non-native my, tetramers? My sense is that monomeric transthyretin basically doesn't exist because it's too sticky. Okay. Or, it, or if it's still native, it goes back to the tetramer because the, dissoci the dissociation constant is really low. Okay, so you're really thinking of non-native tetramers? Well, not, there, there's probably is such a thing as non-native tetramers. Right. And there's certainly a, a spectrum of non-native structures that you can see in a non-denaturing gel. Right. So you get a smear in the patient plasma, suggesting that there are lots of different kinds of structures there. So I guess uh, I'm pushing for precisely what, what do you mean when you say non-native conformations? Because well, it's not the monomer. It, the tetramer is kind of... Operationally, there are structures that don't bind any of the ligands that the native tetramer binds. Okay. They don't bind holoretinol binding protein, and they don't have a native structure. Okay, but you still think they're tetramers, though? No, no. I, I, I just said that I, I think there is such thing as a non-native tetramer. Right. And that's what we think aggregates in the sporadic wild-type cardiomyopathy patients. It's, it's a small population, but we think it's an important one in driving the pathology. Okay. And it doesn't seem to be present in young people, but is present in older people. But you know, it's, it's early days with that hypothesis, I would say. So whether non-responders 
Are there any genetic risk factors there, you know, mild genetic influence? Or secondly, have you spotted any obvious environmental pockets where they're more likely to be non-responders if they live here or there? Or? There, there haven't been nearly as much genetics done here as there have been in PD and AD and HD. That said, there, there has been some. And at this point, there's no smoking gun that would distinguish the non-responders from the responders, like it, ApoE4 or something. And similarly with the uh, spontaneous ones, the sporadic cases, there's no genetic risk profile there that overlaps, for example, with the non-responders. Yeah, I'd be well, really, I'd be really surprised if there weren't a genetic mm. predisposing factor. We just haven't found it yet. Okay, lots of hands up. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned there's still a question around tissue tissue tropism, and so I guess when you look at the different tissues, do you detect? Does I guess does the load does the plaque or amyloid load in the different tissues correspond to the, I guess, the clinical phenotypes you see from these different tissues? Or to kind of flip it on, his, on its head, is there like just a different vulnerability of, of tissues in different people? Maybe some people already have some sort of, some sort of underlying hidden uh, cardiac condition that then they may have a similar load in, in the heart and the, the gut or the brain, but then it's the heart that's the most vulnerable. The, the answer, frankly, is we don't know. I mean, we, we have not done the kind of careful longitudinal imaging that we would need even to make that assessment for amyloid fibrils, let alone the non-native smaller things. It's a really important question. My sense is that it is a non-native structure-based event. That is, whether the cardiomyopathy is observed or whether you know there's peripheral and autonomic neuropathy as the life-threatening initial presentation. Jeff, you ruined my whole buzz that I was getting from this meeting. Because <laughs> I, thought, I thought your story was the greatest story ever told. Now it sucks, Incredible right? triumph. I mean, really unbelievable. And, but now this non-responder thing has me really upset. So um, I'm sort of kidding about that. Yeah. But so what it says is if you look at, is the same, is it this, well, you don't know if the same individuals who are non-responders. You know there are 30% in all of the trials, whether, regardless of modality. And presumably those people have something in common. So yeah. you don't know that yet. We, we don't know whether they have, I mean, the assumption, yeah, they certainly have something in common. But, yeah. but I don't know what that is. I mean, is it possible that there's some sort of weird side effect from that you're masking that they're all responders and then there's some effect that's in the opposite direction that 30% of them are feeling from reduction of transthyretin? I mean, is there nothing bad about reducing transthyretin is the question. There, it's just there, there's no indication from the Ionis or l nylum trials short of a weird effect in the cardiomyopathy l nylum trial that led to deaths that I think is related to the ASO structure and not the TTR uh -huh. knockdown. So there's no significant data that knocking down transthyretin by that level causes a loss of function but the problem. I, I yeah. was very, I mean, I, I think that's completely unnecessary to knock it down that far, but that's this, my. This is a funny, I wanted to bring this up at the end of the meeting, like when we had our wrap ups, but um, this is, I'm proving the point that I was trying to argue, which is if the drug works, right, we should be happy and go home because there's so much we're ignorant of, but if the drug works, that's a great outcome. So, but then I'm myself bothered by the fact that that's so, uh, that's so hard for me to, to swallow that, that I, last bit of the so story. So, Peter, you know? I, I, think, I think the, you're right to be concerned. I, I yeah. think to me this is, the, this is the biggest challenge we all face, right? Because if we have a subpopulation of Huntington patients or PD patients or AD patients who are no longer driven by the proteinopathy, 
and now it's instead of 30%, it's 60%. There's these trials, if they, you run them a year, are never going to be positive. Yeah. So we need, I think it's just so important. It's the most important thing to figure out what's going on in this 30% of patients. We got to know that because I think here, right, these are individuals who are diagnosed pretty early. They're, they're not struggling to go to the neurologist saying, shit, I'm losing my, my memory. I don't want to, I don't want to know. Yeah. These people are, they have congestive heart failure or they're, you know, have all kinds of serious problems, so they go to the doctor. So they get diagnosed relatively early. Yeah, to... Uh, be, uh, to uh, so Adrian is next, but we're gradually transitioning over to mixing success with failure, so you can also ask questions to Ignacio now. I was, uh, I mean, going back to um, to the uh, to the non-responders, uh, uh, an approach which um, I was super impressed uh, is what Aaron Gittler has done uh, for the for the ALS and the ataxin, where uh, and essentially this came. It was uh, it was a yeast screen where uh, uh, for modifiers uh, and uh, ataxin lit up from this, and then he went back into the human genetics uh, and actually ataxin uh, uh, you know because of the bonferroni correction so it, it never actually showed up uh, from the uh, from the givas but when you went directly with uh, hypothesis testing mode uh, then it then it became very clear and he has done it again a couple of uh, months ago with this uh, yep. ANC-13 so so i just wonder whether i mean if you uh, i mean if it is possible to uh, to search for modifiers uh, in a simple uh, cellular system, which then could uh, pivot back to the to the human genetics. Yeah, I, I think that there are people who are now doing this. It's critically important, and you know they're doing it with various cells, and yeah. and I hope that this will yield some yeah. critical insights. My my suspicion is that it's well. I hope that works. But I think it's probably not going to fall out so easily. I, I really think this has to do with the immune system yeah. and differences between the majority and the minority that could flip in the diseases that present later in, in the brain. This is Judith. Can I ask a question? With regard to these non responders, um, so Tafamidis binds to TTR. So the question is, in the non-responders, does it still stabilize the tetramer and engage the target in the same way as in the responders? Yeah, we, we've, we've, we've analyzed this every way to Sunday in terms of stabilization, target engagement, binding constants. We can't see any difference between the responders and the non-responders in terms of pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics in patients. They're just identical. The drug but concentrations in men are a little low, lower than in females, but I don't think that's the reason. But then, does it mean that this stabilized? We haven't, we haven't yet, but that's ongoing now. But does it mean, sorry, just to finish my question, does it mean that the stabilized tetramer still aggregates? Could there be something in the serum of those patients that negates the stabilization that you have with the drug? Yeah, we, we don't know that because unlike Alzheimer's and other trials, we haven't, we haven't done PET imaging of amyloid. So I, I can't answer that in patients. Andrew? Yeah, sorry to keep kicking this non-responder horse, um, but uh, I guess you mentioned like responders versus non-responders. So I think the way we're talking about it, it seems pretty black or white. Like you have like these two discrete groups. Is that that's told true, or is there some kind of it's gradient? pretty true? The the neurologic impairment score change looks like the untreated greater population. So the scores for the non-responders look like there's no benefit whatsoever from being on the stabilizer. Same with the ASOs, as, if, as I understand things. Although that data, unlike ours, hasn't been published yet. Because, yeah, I guess maybe if you were looking at a set of modifiers or something, you would expect maybe some 
some sort of gradient, yes. right, between responders and non-responders. So it's like at some point some like one other discrete mechanism is being switched on? I, my, my sense is that these individuals start out with a proteinopathy, but something's different about them and a second driver starts to predominate. So, and so you fix the proteinopathy and it's just not sufficient to change the disease course. Next, Brad. <laughs> you're going to do first. Are you sure? Okay, I'll ask two, two questions, Jeff. So, what is more of a reflection question for protein directed approaches for neurodegeneration? And as you know, your, your approach is the one that everybody cites as the example that everybody should follow. So, you know, given the way people are approaching protein deposition with different you know, let's just take the amyloid example, which hasn't worked so well in terms of clinical efficacy. What, what, you know, how, how would you take your example and apply it to other indications? The second question is, just to tie it back to the NSF, the complexity of different protein conformations, isoforms, and the lack of tools to study those, either in terms of imaging or in terms of small molecules that will recognize conformations that you can degrade them based on pro tax or tax, which is where the field is going. So can you comment on those two things? Yeah, I, I, I think that developing ligands for, you know, whether they're covalent or non-covalent for the intrinsically distorted proteins will be a game changer. And I fully believe that's possible with a reasonable investment. Um, I do think our, our knowledge, it's, it's a shame that Richard's left. He had to catch a plane. But uh, my perspective is intrinsically disordered proteins always bind to other things. And you can use the small molecules to stabilize that complex and prevent aggregation. So I, I do think this approach is much more general than people have sort of, you know, work, work hopefully will be in the clinic in two years in light chain amyloidosis with a defamatous strict analogous drug. If we get success there, then I think it's we have to go after stabilizers for the big neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, so Brad, has the scientific meeting made you a responder? Are you well enough to ask the question? Can you hear us? He, he, wrote, he wrote the comment. Uh, I, I'll read it. A theme throughout the meeting is that different strains of protein lead to nearly identical clinical pictures, is there a chance that the non-responders have a different conformer? It's, it's not only possible, you know, we have, to, we have to scrutinize this because you could imagine a scenario where seeding becomes a major driver in a subset of patients. I mean, I, I think that's unlikely, but it's not impossible. So it, we, there are, that's one of the things that we're but if I got it right, you showed that there is no change in the level of amyloid, so, right? When so people change take in the level of? Of deposits that are already, right? You can, you, you stabilize TTR, but the amount of amyloid that's already accumulated doesn't seem to change, right? In, in, mm -hmm. in the old days, the, with liver transplant, you, you sort of see some clearance, right? Right, that's, that's true, Halal, but it still doesn't mean that a, an aggregate that's present that has a distinct conformer can't be spinning out very efficiently mm -hmm. aggregates from a small population of transthyretin that's not liganded. So mm -hmm. that could that's what's going to be my second question. I, I think that's unlikely, the, yeah, but we, it's possible. We wouldn't have been able to distinguish the different conformers in, in tau unless we, you know, by good luck, I guess, um, use the right assay. So every other asset we used, they looked identical. And then, you know, but by mass spec, they didn't. And, and you're in, in, in this, in your case, my guess is by mass spec, they might look the same. Although who knows, there could be some post-translational modifications or something. Um, but the, the, there may well be different conformers. And, you know, the resonance there with CJD and with synuclein and with, with tau, I, I think would suggest that it's likely that there are different conformers and maybe some of them are more likely to adopt a benign f form, and, and maybe some of them, if you stabilize them, they're still a little bit toxic. Yeah, I, I, there, in my mind, there's no doubt that there are multiple conformers in these individuals that are non-native. 
your hypothesis, Brad, is, is absolutely worth testing. And it's relatively easy based on what Mark Diamond has done to make a cell line where we can probe this. And we will. I think that's a good idea. So, so during the we coffee break, NSF will give you a grant. About whether that's the right strategy for, for these sorts of molecules. But ha ha happy to. I mean, we've, we've really done a lot to investigate. Well, no, no stone uncovered, right? And we don't know where the, the solution's going to be. And if we can do an experiment, I think we should do it. And that's a pretty straightforward one. Someone doing the cryo from these patients? Because in yes, these amyloids, Van, you, you can has collect a, a lot few... of, there is a lot of amyloid. Like, it's not, it's not like the brain amyloids. So Fandrich has done a few TTR amyloid structures. It really does look like it's the full-length protein that yeah. aggregates, and once it gets in the fibril, it gets cut in the middle. Because yeah. it's hard to imagine how the two pieces would yes. always come together in the fibril if that weren't the case. But I guess it's possible that it gets cut and then it aggregates, so we don't know for sure. But there are several structures, and different patients have different structures. But again, I want to come back to the fact that the amyloid load in these patients does not change in the responders. So we have two grant proposals on the board. We have also Malu has written a tweet, which is a grant proposal. You and I should look at TTR-specific T cells in these subjects. And Brad has his proposal up there already. All right, one more hand was up. Well, we need help, so that's good. Thank you. I have a final question to you. Oops. And um, I just let you put that away. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeff, while while that's going on, I, I was curious about one thing. Oh, yeah. Is there any reason to think that people who have who have a beta CAA and people of TTR uh, related vascular alterations are those, you know, synergistic? Is it A plus B equals AB? Is it, you know, a whole lot worse? I mean, is could there be an, another common disorder going on that's synergizing with your TTR individuals that's, you know, sort of covering up the benefit that they would ordinarily be getting from the drug. Yeah, I think that's a great hypothesis that absolutely needs to be tested um, because there could be a subset, <laughs> subset of AB patients who really have TTR dementia and not, not only A-beta. Well, you know, Jeff, uh, as far as we know, 79% of them have something in addition to classical AD. Exactly. If you told me that that was actually 84%, at this point, I'm just not going to be surprised, you know? I would be surprised if it weren't the case in a subset of individuals that is your hypothesis is true. Yeah. I just have a question on the drug concentration that you need <clears throat> in patients, Jeff. Yeah. No, no worries. Um, I was just wondering because you, you mentioned this this protein is very abundant in the periphery, so it's in yeah. the micromolar range. So I assume your drug must be very safe and be given at very high concentration because it binds almost stoichiometrically. So, so that, Can you comment on that? That's that's something I should have mentioned. Okay, I mean the 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 fortunately, tafamidus is incredibly safe, and it's also ninety five percent orally bioavailable. So. The plasma, it's 60 milligrams once a day, the plasma concentration reaches 30 micromolar. Okay. And it goes down to about 25 at TRA, 22, 25. So it's, it's a pretty good agent. The downside is it was hard to formulate, but. Parkinson's or anything else, we need extremely high concentrations in case we want to stabilize the monomer or anything like that. So, yeah, so, so Pfizer was. That's a big was, issue, right? Pfizer recently canceled their non, their non covalent hemoglobin stabilizer, but they, they got to pretty high concentrations with a small molecule, and that's a big organization. So I, I think if you're below 50 micromolar, you can get there with good pharmacology. Above that's tricky. Thanks. A yeah. couple of more minutes, I think, before we go. Adriano, the FDA did not approve this drug, but they have it approved at Acunumab. How does that feel? So, and that's 95% of the patients who also have peripheral neuropathy. But before that approval 
existed, probably a thousand neuropathy patients in the U.S. died. So, oh. I I have a question maybe to both Jeff, kind of spanning Jeff and Nacho's presentations. So the the really the the handle to, to have a successful drug for TTR is that there is a clear native state to stabilize. But if one would want, I mean, presumably the lesson from this is the earlier in the misfolding and aggregation pathway that you can intervene, the better. So how, how would you think about this for proteins such as Huntington or alpha synuclein, where the native—I mean, there must be a kind of native state within the cell, but it's not very clear what it is or how to stabilize it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think for almost all these quote-unquote intrinsically disordered proteins, they form complexes with other proteins, and that AB or higher-order complex can be stabilized pharmacologically. I mean, the, the other strategy that I find quite appealing is to, dis, to discover small molecule covalent modifiers of alpha synuclein and Huntington, which could allow them to function but lower their aggregation propensity. I, I think that's definitely possible. It's just going to take an effort. Yeah, and that would have to happen at a very early stage in aggregation because if you stabilize... What? oligomers, then you might make well, things worse. That's the question, Judith, isn't it? Because I, I think if, if you talk to 95% of the, the cardiology experts, they laughed at me. There's no way this drug is going to work. The heart is twice as big as it's supposed to be, and it's twice as big because of the amyloid burden. But interestingly, when those people started taking tofamidus, they could now walk two or three miles which was shocking to the cardiologists, right? Because they were convinced it was an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. But clearly that's not what's sending the people to the, that's not good. They're not gonna be able to run a marathon, but that's not what's killing them. So it's a, it's a really important question, Judith. I mean, you know, Finkbinder has shown unequivocally in cells that, and you've shown that forming these aggregates is actually protective for a while. So, so did the hearts shrink from no, no, they definitely don't shrink. So, Ignacio, how do you feel about stabilizing Huntington in some way? Do you think this is a solution to the problem, so it can't form aggregates? Well, it, uh, you know, hi, Judith. Sorry, I missed your question before. But it, I think in Huntington's, one of the key problems is what is the pathological species of Huntington? So is it full-length Huntington that doesn't normally aggregate? Is that a problem? Or is you know, you need to generate an amino terminal fragment, and that's when, so that's the first question that I think needs to be answered. And I think people are, people are beginning to do experiments genetically to understand if you don't produce, let's say, exon one through misplacing, do you get aggregation? And so far, the data seems to be in the mouse that maybe that's not, I mean, that is a driver of the aggregation, whether that happens in humans or not. I think part of the problem is we don't have a lot of direct binder small molecules that can do something that we can study phenotypically what the consequences in any experimental system. So the way, rather than trying to understand a priori, what we're trying to do is find high affinity binding small molecules that are selective and then test them experimentally. That's the way we're going about it. But. Maybe Hilal can comment and also carry us into the coffee break. We have two minutes till coffee. I mean, I think the secret to TTR was two things. One, the structure, having actually, you know, the structure and finding the binding site. And the second one was identifying the rate limiting step, right? It's, it's all that careful biophysics and chemistry showing that it's tetramer to monomer. And that's really unlocked this. So for, for synuclein, for Huntington, for things. The first thing we need to know is what is the native structure in the native environment. I mean, these proteins are unfolded, but in the cell they're not unfolded. They're either part of a complex or they're bound to membranes where there are structure. So that sort of figure out first, what's those structural properties in the native state and what's the trigger? What happens that allow, you know, disrupt that state? then I think you have a way to start. In Huntington, 
you know, we have data. I don't think we know it's not the full length protein, but you know, the Huntington is probably requires a proteolysis step, and, and sort of if you block that, you can block it. I think with that, we go to a break. We'll come back.